We should start in chapter 11, verse 23, and then we'll read through verse 6. It says, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses. And Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. Then the land rested from war. These are the kings of the land whom the children of Israel defeated and whose land they possessed on the other side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon and all the eastern Jordan plain. One king was Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled half of Gilead from Aroer, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, from the middle of that river, even as far as the river Jabbok, which is on the border of the Ammonites, and the eastern Jordan plain from the Sea of Chinneroth, as far as the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, Sea of Galilee, and the Salt Sea, Dead Sea, the road to Beth Jemash, and southward below the slopes of Pisgah. The other king was Og, king of Bashan, and his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants who dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Edri and reigned over Mount Hermon, over Salak, over all Bashan, as far as the border of the Jeshurites and Machathites, and over half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. These Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel conquered, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given it as a possession to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Here in chapter 12, the rest of it, and we'll go through it, we're given the list of kings that have been defeated thus far by Israel. The first section is those defeated on the east side of the Jordan River. This is where Moses battled. And then the second half is going to be the ones that Joshua was able to destroy and overcome on the west side of the Jordan, which we know as the Promised Land. To us, this portion of Scripture, let's be honest, it's not our favorite verse. I don't know if anybody's favorite verse is Joshua 12, 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or anywhere in this chapter. We come to a portion of Scripture like this and we just go, all right, time to speed read. If it's our devotional time, we can just skip it. Sometimes we're tempted to do so and I won't fault you for doing so. A list of kings, it's not that important, we may say. But this was their history. And this history would determine their future in who got what section of the promised land and who got what section of the eastern side of the Jordan River that wasn't a part of the promised land. But these two and a half tribes, they settled for less than what God wanted. We see this balance in Scripture. A balance of looking back to what God has done in order to encourage us with our future. It's not looking back at past accomplishments as the fruit of our spiritual health, but it's to look back at what God has done in order to propel us to move forward with Him today. And sometimes we're prone to do one of two extremes. Either we're just always talking about the past, Or we're just always so focused on the future, we forget the past and anyone in our past. Uh, A quote I love from Charles Spurgeon, he says, We are too prone to engrave our trials in marble and write our blessings in sand. And I think it's not just our blessings, but what about past sins and temptations and trials that we've been able to conquer? Have we written any of these things down? Have we forgotten who we once were and the great victories that our Joshua, Jesus Christ, has brought? I know within my life, some of the victories have been sexual immorality, cussing, being overly competitive in certain sports and board games even, pornography, miscarriage, financial troubles, thinking of myself less and less. A selfishness in marriage. All of these different things. I've seen Christ come into my life and just be victorious. Some of them happened quickly. Some of them were long drawn out battles. What are some of the kings? Our Joshua, Jesus has led us in 
in victory. Do you have a list? Have you ever written down anything like this? Do you take a moment to step back and think and ponder on these things? Did some of those things seem insurmountable at one point? I know with me, some of these addictions, they just seem like, Lord, I'm going to be stuck with this the rest of my life. But even as we looked at last week, you give the Lord your obedience and you give him time. And it's incredible what he will do. He leads us in victory. He's already won the victory. We just need to be obedient to his word and be patient. Then he can lead us in victory over the next sin, the next temptation, the next trial or the next weight or burden that tries to ensnare us. Write down these things, not just our blessings in marble, but also our victories, the victories that Jesus has won. Write those things down in marble that we can look back from time to time and remind ourselves of just how good our Lord is. And if God was able to overcome Jericho, hey, he's going to be able to overcome the next great walled city in our lives. In verses 2 through 5, I won't fumble over those names over again for you guys. But we see the Lord through Moses, he defeated two great kings. We see Og of Bashan, and then we see the other king of Sihon of the Amorites. And it's good for us to be reminded of those who have come before us who have made our path easier. Where you're at at the church today, the church looked drastically different three years ago and six years ago and nine years ago and ten years ago, so on and so forth. I love Matthew Henry. He says, fresh mercies must not drown out the remembrance of former mercies. Nor must the glory of present instruments of good to the church diminish the just honor of those who went before them. Since God is the same who wrought by both. At the end of the day, the Lord is the one that has brought the victory, but he uses different vessels at different times and at different points. And we should always treat others in the way we want to be treated. I think, again, within churches, we're prone to two extremes. Either you're always honoring the past and you have these huge 10 by 10 portraits of pastors or pastor's wives as you enter into churches. Uh, The pew will have somebody's name written on it and you're just honoring the past. But then there's also this temptation to just sort of erase the past as if that person never existed. Just scrub them completely out of our church history. Once again, there must be a a balance, a balance to these things. Verse 6, the servant of uh, these Moses, the servant of the Lord and the children of Israel had conquered. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given it as a possession to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. These were the two tribes and a half tribes that settled for less than what God had for them. They would suffer the consequences of settling for less than what God's intended will was for them. There's a concept that sometimes can break people's minds. There's God's will and then there's God's permissive will. Where God had this best, this A plus plan for your life. But sometimes he allows us to go with plan B or C or D and even times plan F. You see, these two and a half tribes, God wanted them inside of the promised land. But these guys, they were into the cattle business, and they said, hey, this part of the Jordan, this is modern-day Jordan, it's on the east side of the Jordan River, this is great for cattle and cattle grazing, let's just stay here. God allowed them, God's permissive will allow them to settle for less, but now they would always be the first ones to get attacked anytime any enemy nation would come in. They would be the first ones to be led away captive to Babylon and to Assyria because they were on the border on the other side of the Jordan. So within our life, may we continue to say, Lord, I don't want to settle for less than your best plan for my life. Now in verse 7 and 8, we begin seeing these kings conquered by Joshua. 
These are the kings of the country which Joshua, the children of Israel, conquered on this side of the Jordan on the west, from Baal Gad and the valley of Lebanon as far as Mount Halak and the ascent of Seir, which Joshua gave to the tribes of Israel as a possession according to their divisions. In the mountain country, in the lowlands, in the Jordan plain, in the slopes, in the wilderness, and in the south, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Guzik mentions, again, this only seems tedious to us because it's not our land. If it were our land, we would reach even this verse with great interest. Imagine having a synopsis of every battle that America has gone through and now the land or the finances that we gained from these battles. These battles in the Rockies, this is how we gained this, in the Appalachians, in the swamps of Louisiana, etc., etc. If we had this type of list, we would have a picture in our minds of these areas. Now verses 9 through 24, we get this list of kings. King of Jericho, Ai, which was besides Bethel. Bethel. Then the king of Jerusalem, Hebron. Of Jarmuth, Lachish. Of Eglon, Gezer, Debir, Geder, Horma, Arad. Verse 15. Libna, uh, Adalam, Makeda, Bethel, Tapua, Hefer, Aphek, Lasharon, Madon, Hazor, Shimron, Miron. The king of Ak, Shef. Sha'af. This is always fun. One, the king of Tanakh, the king of Megiddo, one. Kadesh, one. The king of Jokneam in Carmel, one. The king of Dor in the heights of Dor, one. The king of the people of Gilgal, one. The king of Tirza, one. All the kings, 31. The blessing here is to look at all that God was able to accomplish with Joshua, their leader. Joshua, the fearful one. Joshua, the one that we saw four times, the Lord telling him, Joshua, be strong and of good courage. And Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua took small steps of faith. He gave God his obedience He gave God time, and now we see all these kings that they were able to defeat. One commentator says, victory is possible along the way. We need only follow the example of Israel's leader, Joshua, who believed in God, took God at his word, and trusted in his promises, and relied on his presence. As a result, he vanquished his enemies. May we believe in God... Take him at his word, trust his promise, and rely on his presence. We have this great hope for us as well in 1 John 5, verse 4. It tells us, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The the world, all the madness going on around us, that won't overcome us. That won't defeat us. We have been born to overcome. If you're born again. If you're born again, know that you were born for such a time as this. To not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. We also see just how good of a bookkeeper God is. We have all these specific details, all these specific cities, all these specific kings, all these specific mountains and rivers, and all of this, just how specific our God is, that we can read these details thousands of years later. We should be reminded in heaven there's still more books to be opened and read. The Lamb's Book of Life and many other books detailing our life's work. Are we going to heaven or not? Our God is a perfect bookkeeper. Alan Redpath, he states, sometimes in the course of human experience, it is good to sit down and reflect on what has been conquered by the grace of God. Not boastfully, but with a humble and grateful heart. To survey the years that have gone and to go over the pages of memory carefully to recall where the grace of God has triumphed. So that we would be able to look to Christ in his face and say, But where sin abounded, 
grace did much more abound. It's good to look back. I would encourage you, if you haven't done so in a long time, take a step back and just look back at all that the Lord has done in your life. It, it helps us overcome sin. It helps us overcome temptation. It helps us overcome fear and anxiety when it grips us to just take a step back and consider our life at just how good God has been. This past Sunday, we looked at the Lord's Supper and the institution of communion and the new covenant we have in Christ. And that was another great reminder to me. The next time we're faced with a temptation that seems impossible, I would encourage you to take a step back and take communion. Take communion for five or ten minutes and see if all of a sudden you're given the power to overcome whatever that temptation may be. Whatever that emotional temptation that's gripping your heart, take a step back, take communion. Hey, you don't have the perfect grape juice and the perfect matzo crackers. I won't say who. I've seen people take communion with all sorts of different things. With Cuban crackers and materva. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. (laughs) It's all about focusing on what the Lord has done for us. And it's so good to take a step back and consider what Christ has gone through for me. Can Can I not say no to this temptation for 24 more hours in view of what Christ has done for me? Now the book of Joshua pivots here. Thus far, we've been reading about the conquest of the land from chapters 1 through 12. The conquest over land, the enemy nations within the promised land, and these list of kings. Now from Joshua 13 through 21, we see the land being allocated and divided to each of the 12 tribes. And then finally, in chapter 22 through 24, we see Joshua having one final appeal to the nation of Israel, pleading with them for their consecration. In chapter 13, verse 1, it tells us, Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old. Advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. Don't you love how gentle God the Father is with his sons? <laughs> he treats his sons and his daughters a bit differently here, right? In the King James Version, it says, You are old and stricken in years. It's interesting because Moses, in Deuteronomy 34, verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died or when the Lord took him. And it tells us his eyes were not dim nor his natural vigor diminished. So Moses is 120, ready for another battle. And yet God says, hey Mo, it's time, it's time to come up here. No, no, it's time to get up here. And yet Joshua here is anywhere from 92 to 100 years old at this point, And being advanced in years or well stricken in years speaks of Josh being worn out at this point. God makes each and every one of his servants differently. I've seen two different pastors, right? Our, our pastor is a prime example. Pastor Raz at 70 looks a lot different than other pastors I've seen at 50, right? The, the Lord makes us differently. And there's a lot of blessings we see here in this verse. Joshua is somewhere between 92 to 100 years old, and yet he can still hear the voice of the Lord. He's well stricken in years, and yet he's still hearing That's still small voice. We can consider Eli, the high priest, and Samuel. Eli hadn't heard the voice of the Lord. Samuel, young Samuel, was the one hearing the voice of God. And now Eli's begging Samuel to tell him what God had spoken to him. The other great thing that we see here is even though Joshua was in his 90s or even 100 years old, there was still more for him to do. God was not done with him. I don't know if you consider yourself old yet or if you consider yourself well-stricken in years yet. I tell my kids, they ask me, Dada, are you old or are you young? I say, I'm in this weird spot. Young people think I'm old and old people think I'm young. I'm just in this middle ground, this middle spot. God still has more for you to do. He's not done with you yet. 
Uh, let's turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 71, and then Psalm 92. Psalm 71, verse 17. O God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Let's jump to Psalm 92. Psalm 92, we see something similar here, verse 12 through 15. Verse 12, it tells us, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. I think it's so cool that Joshua is anywhere from 92 to 100. And in the next chapter, chapter 14, we'll read about Caleb who's 85. And yet both of these men still wanted more. For the Lord. Both of these men still saw that there was more land to be won over for God, for their tribe, for their children, and their children's children. I mean, you guys are students of the Bible. At what age did Moses retire and enjoy his house on the Mediterranean Ocean? He didn't. How about Joshua? How about Caleb? None of these men in Scripture you do not see Retirement. Retirement is an American thing that has crept up into our hearts, and we sort of take a lot of American things and we slap them into the Bible. Jesus tells us in John 17, 4, did Jesus retire on earth? He says, I've glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Can any of us say that? I've finished the work which you have given me me to do there's still more work to be done in John 4 34 Jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work this is what sustained Jesus this is what brought him enjoyment this is what brought him excitement was the work of him who sent him to finish it In Ephesians chapter 2.10, it tells us that we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Family, can we say we have walked into every good work which God has prepared beforehand for us? Or if we're honest, has God laid down certain good works in front of us and we give our reasons why that's not for us? Sometimes we think too little of ourselves and we say, no, that's far above me, I can't handle that. And sometimes we think too much of ourselves and we say that's far below what I'm capable of and what these hands are made for. I don't want to be anywhere near that. Jesus is very clear in Matthew 25, 23. He tells us, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Where is our trust? Where is our retirement? Where is our excitement in our youth, the sixth graders that are here tonight? In our young adult age, right, that 18 to 30, in midlife, in post-midlife, at the end of life, where is our trust and excitement in? Is it in houses or cars or boats or vacations? 
Is it just in fishing or golf or being out on the glades or sitting on the beach doing nothing? Is this where our excitement and hope and joy is found? Nothing wrong with these things. I I like cars. I like fishing. I like the glades. I like being on the beach. But is this what my whole life has become about? Jesus warns us in Matthew 6, 20 and 21, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Then he also warns us in 1 John 2, 17, it tells us the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Where is our investment in? Do we think we've hit an age where now we no longer need to invest in the kingdom of God? My prayer is for more Joshua's and Caleb's and even like the psalmist that men who are gray-headed would be able to say, I declare your strength to this generation. That some of the ladies, I won't say you're gray-headed, but some of the ladies (laughs) would be able to declare your strength to this generation and your power to everyone who is still to come. That they would be declaring that God is upright. He's my rock and there's no unrighteousness in him. My prayer is that those that are advanced in years would have sweet relationships with their kids and their grandkids. That they'd want to sit with you and you tell them about God's great strength and power and love. Like we started off the study, you'd be able to tell them of the kings and the victories Christ has given you. And if you don't have those kids or grandkids or maybe there's a difficulty in the family right now, you get to practice with the family of God. There's so much need in the children's ministry, so much need within the youth ministry, so much need within young adults and men's and in ladies. And instead we're caught up with the American dream realizing it's all going to burn one day. It's all falling apart, rust, moth, All of these things are burning and eating away. I'm blessed to be able to see pastors in their old age and they have an army of sons or other pastors they've been poured into around them. They don't have to worry about who's going to take care of them when they get older because they poured their life out into other people. It's interesting. Some people, they just get caught up with all the stuff and at the end, there's no one there to take care of them. There's just people licking their chops, waiting for them to die, to take all of their stuff. There's just such sweet joy when we do things biblically, when we're pouring out our lives into others, how the Lord, He takes care of us. David Guzik, he also paints another picture with this verse. He says, what the land was to Israel, Jesus is to us. We are to possess all of Him and to keep pressing on till you have all of Jesus. Family, how much of Jesus do you have? How much of the Bible do you possess as yours? Do you walk in the blessing of leading others to Jesus Christ? Do you walk in the blessings of answered prayer, of meeting the needs of others in God's family? Or have you settled? May we continue to press on and say, Lord, continue to conform me to your image and likeness. Lord, I know it's the fellowship of your suffering But if you're there, Lord, that's where I want to be. Because he tells them in verse 2, back to Joshua chapter 12, verse 2, he says, This is the land that yet remains. Josh, you're old and there's still so much to take. All the territory of the Philistines and all that of the Jeshurites from Sihor, which is east of Egypt, as far as the border of Ekron northward, which is counted as Canaanite. The five lords of the Philistines, the Gazites, the Ashdodites, the Ashkelonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, also the Avites. From the south, all the land of the Canaanites and Merah that belongs to the Sidonians, as far as Aphek, to the border of the Amorites, to the land of the Gebelites and all Lebanon towards the sunrise. From Baal Gad, below Mount Hermon, as far as the entrance to Hamath. All the inhabitants of the mountains from Lebanon, as far as the land of Misraph, and all the Sidonians. 
them I will drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide it by lot to Israel as an inheritance as I have commanded you. There's still so much land to be won, so much land to gain. And he says, only divide it by lot to Israel as an inheritance, as I've commanded you. Now, God wanted to divide the promised land to each tribe and the inheritance by lot. This would protect Joshua and the leadership from giving their tribes more than they should have. And it also protected Joshua and the leadership from being accused of giving more land to this tribe because they liked them or they hooked them up with certain lambs or anything like that. They would sort of have all the names in one section. Okay, this is for this area. And now, okay, this, you get the Gadite to go here. Okay, this is for this area. Judah, you go here. So on and so forth. I love this. Robert Jameson, he says, The overruling control of God is conclusively proved because each tribe received their possession as predicted by Jacob and by Moses. You see, this isn't the incredible thing about God. Even all the way back in Genesis 49, Jacob pronounces blessings and curses upon his 12 sons, and every single one comes to fruition. And then Moses in Deuteronomy 33, he also, he says, hey, this is where the different areas are going to go. This is where the different tribes are going to go. And yet God brings it all to fruition. In Proverbs 16, verse 33, it tells us the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. See, before Christ, this is oftentimes how God's people would hear the will of God. The priests would have the Urim and the Thummim, and there'd be yes or no. They wouldn't look, and they'd pull out a stone, and they would take a yes or a no from the Lord. For us today, we have the very word of God. This is how we hear God's will. It's through his word. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us that we allow the peace of God to rule and guard our hearts. Verse 7, now therefore divide this land as an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. We'll continue to see this from here on out through the book of Joshua. The difference between inheritance and and possession inheritance and possession God gave each of the tribes an inheritance but it was up to them to possess more land or not it was up to each and every one of them David Guzik he says each tribe was responsible to possess their own land completely God emphasizes the idea of personal responsibility and initiative this is not only because that's how things get done, but also because that is how people are blessed in service. We are blessed. Anybody here say, God, I want you to bless me? Just a handful of people. We'll pray for the rest of you. Or, hey, I'll take your blessing. You don't want it? I want it. We are blessed by personally taking responsibility and initiative in trusting God to do what he has called us to do. So often as believers, we just want to lie on our back and say, God, hit me with the blessing. doesn't work that way. The way we are blessed by the Lord is the just shall live by faith. That's the way. We have to take responsibility and initiative in trusting God to do what he has called us to do. We have to take steps of faith. We have to trust what his word says about sin and us having dominion over sin and sin not having dominion over us. May we continue to grow, not just in the past seasons, but from here on forward. I don't know if anybody here is 100 years old. If you are, God still has more land for you to go out and possess. Chuck Smith, he states the following. He says, now the tragic thing with so many Christians is they start off in the spirit in a powerful way. They make great initial spiritual strides in their lives, but then they will hit a spiritual plateau where complacency settles over them, and they're no longer eager for conquest. They're no longer really striving for the mark, for the prize of the high calling of God. But they begin to sort of kick back into spiritual ease and rest upon past victories. 
So that oftentimes when you talk to them in their conversation, it's always about some past spiritual victory. Always about some past blessing that they experienced in their life. But there's nothing fresh. There's nothing up to date. Most of their spiritual victories are relegated to some historical period in their own walk and experience. And they're always remembering the glory days of the past. Again, that doesn't have to be us. 100-year-old Joshua, there's still more to do. 85-year-old Caleb, there's still more promises I want. We don't have to be here. And it's not just an old person thing. There are young people that they hit college and they say, oh, man, I used to serve the Lord so much in high school. There are people, once they get married, oh, I remember how much I used to serve the Lord. May that not be said of any of us. May we, like Jesus, be able to say, hey, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Verse 8, with the other half tribe, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses had given them beyond the Jordan eastward, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given them from Ar Or, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and the town that is in the midst of the ravine, and all the plain of Me, Deba, as far as Dibon, all the cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, as far as the border of the children of Ammon. Gilead, the border of the Jeshurites, Machathites, all Mount Hermon, and all Bashan, as far as Salka, and all the kingdom of Og and Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth and Edri, who remained of the remnant of the giants, for Moses had defeated and cast out these. Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Jeshurites or the Machathites, but the Jeshurites and the Machathites dwell among Israelites until this day, only to the tribe of Levi. He had given no inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance as he said to them. The beautiful thing of the tribe of Levi, I've gone over this several times, is that they were cursed to have nothing. And yet because they took a stand for righteousness when the Israelites were all dancing and having orgies before the golden calf, they were willing to take a stand and now God blessed them by taking a stand. So instead of just being cursed, now they still have no inheritance, but now their inheritance would be enjoying the sacrifices of the Lord God for the rest of Israel. They would be able to enjoy sweet fellowship with God by breaking bread with God in a sense that when people would come and sacrifice to the Lord, certain pieces of those sacrifices would be given to the Levites to share with the person making the sacrifice, to share with the Lord, and then even to take back to their own families. Some people think it's strange to get paid from a church, but we see here with the Levites, they took a portion of the sacrifices, and that's how the Levites were able to live. They didn't have an inheritance. It's also a beautiful thing because instead of having their own section within Israel, God would spread them all throughout the nation. He would spread the Levites and their preserving influence over the entire nation of Israel. There would be Levitical cities in each of the tribes where Levites would be living and growing their own uh, fruits, vegetables, and raising their own cattle. In Psalm 16, verse 5 through 6, it says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Then we come to the land of Reuben. And tonight, chapter 13, it's only the two and a half tribes that settled for less than what God wanted to give them. I got a map here. Let's see if it pops up. Help us out a little bit more visually of the different tribes and their allotments. We'll see if it works or if it doesn't work. I threw it at them last second. So we'll get a better version next time. But you see here the different tribes. It's just the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan. So here's the half tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Gad, and the tribe of Reuben. 
The Jordan River is cut right down the center. Everything on the west side, that's the promised land. Everything on the east side, that's the tribe of uh, the current nation of Jordan is what we would see that as today. We'll, do, we'll be able to put those maps out on the church website if you look up this teaching later on. So I'll read through this and then uh, see where we sort of stop on the last verse and gather some more things as well. Tribe of Reuben, Moses had given them, verse 15, to the tribe of the children of Reuben an inheritance according to their families. We see different rivers, different cities mentioned. One key thing is in verse 20, it says Beth Peor, the slopes of Pisgah. Then in verse 22, it reminds us that in this area is where the children of Israel killed with the sword Balaam, the son of Beor, the soothsayer among those who were killed by them. This reminds us that our God is a just and a righteous God. If you remember Balaam, he was instructed by God to only bless the nation of Israel. He tries to curse them again and again and again. He can't help but bless them. But then he tells the enemy kings to instead send young women to Israel because then the Israelites, they'll fall in love with them, they'll start having sex with them, and then God will destroy them because they'll slowly give their heart to the gods of these enemy nations. God, he punished Balaam. Even in Numbers 31 verse 8, it tells us that Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. We continue verse 23, it tells us, and the border of the children of Reuben was the bank of the Jordan. This was the inheritance of the children of Reuben according to their families, the cities, and their villages. Verse 24, the land of Gad. Moses also had given an inheritance to the tribe of Gad, to the children of Gad according to their families, their territory. Once again, I would encourage you, you can sit down with a good map and read all of these cities and these mountains, the water of the Jordan. Verse 28, this is the inheritance of the children of Gad according to their families, the cities, and their villages. Then the half-tribe of Manasseh. The beautiful thing about the Lord is that if you notice even in that map, Manasseh, it's not like they're in two random places, but the Lord puts the whole tribe together and the Jordan River is just right in the middle of them. So even though you have this half that they wanted to settle for less than what God had, he still joined them together with the Jordan River cutting the two. Verse 29, Moses also had given them an inheritance to the, tri- to the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was for the half-tribe of the children of Manasseh according to their families. Verse 32 These are the areas which Moses had distributed as an inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward. It's important for us to know it's been about seven years of battle. These two and a half tribes, they said, let us build fortified cities. Let us leave our children here, our wives here, and our cattle here. And because these men settled for less than what God had for them, they probably did not see their wives or their children for the last seven and a half years. There's God's permissive will and God's just will. It's going to happen. His perfect will. There's consequences to settling for less than what God has for us. Finally, verse 33. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses had given No inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance as he had said to them. Some believers, they enjoy more comforts than others on this earth. And I don't know why. There's some believers, they can handle hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions, billions of dollars. And that's a blessing. They should tithe and they should help aid the work of the Lord. And then there are some other believers, if you go on a mission trip to Africa or South America, believers that are stronger believers than we are, and yet they have nothing. And I don't know why it is that God, to some he gives a greater earthly inheritance, and to others he gives a smaller earthly inheritance. But for all Christians, the tribe that we most likely ought to identify with, it's the Levites. Where the Lord is truly our inheritance. 
The land is a blessing and we use that blessing to further the kingdom of God. But at the end of the day, this is not our home. At the end of the day, this is not my inheritance. These things, they come and they go. They're tools to be able to bless God and bless his people. But let's turn quickly to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 reminds us. First Peter chapter 2 verse 4. Verse 4 and 5 it says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're that holy priesthood. That's what God has called us to be. If we're saved, there's, there's no other way around it. We are called to be a part of that holy priesthood, that we would be offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.6 tells us that he has made us kings and priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Colossians 1.12 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. What type of inheritance do we have? 1 Peter 1.4, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Earlier we read about the treasures in this earth that they rust away, the moths eat them away, and the thieves come and steal them away. But as believers, as modern day Levites, we are blessed to have an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, it cannot fade away, and it's reserved in heaven for you. So believer, don't complain with what you have or with what you don't have. Every once in a while you hear a Christian that says, man, the millionaire Christians should just give us Christians more of their stuff. That was, shouldn't be a Christian communist. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Can't be saying, hey, give me your stuff. That doesn't work that way. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom. Jesus didn't go to the priest and say, hey, give me more of your stuff. It didn't work that way. So for us, man, we should be content with what the Lord has given us. Be content with what God has given you and be reminded, this isn't my home. My inheritance is still to come. Yes, I need to provide for my home. Got to provide for my family. It's good to be able to provide and be wise so you can give not only to your own family, but give to others who are in need. But at the end of the day, the Lord, that's our inheritance. Being able to offer sacrifices with him and for him, that's our inheritance. To be able to have personal access to God, that is our inheritance. So I would encourage you, if there's still land to be won in your life, if there's still more of Christ to meet and learn in your life, man, even if you're 100 years old, there's still more land to be won. So let's all stand. Pastors, if you guys would come forward. Worship team, if you guys would come up. And we'll close in song. If you need prayers, pastors will be up front. They'd love to pray with you. Uh, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for just the reminders, uh, Lord, in the Old Testament and in the New, Lord, how you have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. And Lord, forgive us. Forgive us when we don't take those steps of faith, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, the regrets we have of opportunities you gave us. And Lord, our pride, whether thinking of ourselves as too big or too small, Lord, God in the way, Lord. Uh, our sin, Lord, it got in the way. But Lord, help us. Help us to, from here on out, Lord, just run hard after you, Lord. That from here on out, we would be seeking to hear from you, to hear that still small voice. And Lord, to be obedient, to live that life of faith, Lord, to be the just that live by faith. So Lord, we thank you. 
We thank you that you've already won the victory, Lord, and now you've just called us to be overcomers and to walk in that victory. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Jesus. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.